This notebook belongs to a climber called Ian Ogilvy. It contains his remarkable account of what happened on the 17th of April 1966, when Ogilvy and his two friends set off to climb Anne Chellach, a remote and hostile peak in the northwest of Scotland. Over the years, I've been involved in hundreds of mountain rescues, many of them difficult and some of them dangerous. It's easy to get blasé, but just occasionally one comes across an act of bravery that seems to go beyond the bounds of rational behaviour. And for me, Ian Ogilvy's effort that day was quite outstanding. What does Anchelic mean? Translated into English, it means the forge. Very aptly named. People get hammered on it. Only if they're careless. Or inexperienced. Why did you ask me? Sherpa Tensing had to pull out at the last minute. No, seriously, we thought you might like to start your ice climbing career on something really worthwhile. Charles was right. For a climber, this mountain was worthwhile. Spring had officially arrived three weeks earlier, but had made no impression on the windswept gullies still bursting with winter snow. And Chella had chosen to ignore the spring. How long is it going to take to get to the top? Two, two and a half hours to the ridge. Well done, we'd better get a move on. Well, have you got everything? Just check. Mittens, Zach. You've got me crampons, haven't you? Yeah. Anyone get a weather forecast this morning? Cloudy later. Maybe some snow. <laughs> that could mean anything up here. Hey, yeah, Peter. Case first climbing problem. Grade one fence. The three of us had travelled up from London to spend a week in the hills. For Peter Francis, this would be his first attempt at climbing on snow and ice. He had been on one of my climbing courses a few months earlier and had learnt reasonably well. But like most young men, he was eager for a much sterner test of his newfound abilities. Charles Handley was an old friend, experienced, confident and reliable. Over the years we had shared a lot together, climbing in Britain and the Alps and surviving the even shorter odds offered on the trips to the Himalayas. And Chelach at three and a half thousand feet was hardly the Alps and still less the Himalayas, but I knew that on its day this mountain could be just as cruel as either of those great ranges. And Anchelach was ancient. The ridge we were shortly to climb was 700 million years old, but trying to make sense of that figure produced a wave of historical vertigo. After 45 minutes, we reached the snow and our pace slowed down Peter had yet to find the rhythm that would conserve his energy and hasten our progress. But it didn't matter. We weren't chasing records. And even more important, the weather seemed to be holding. Got 
Get stuck. Shall I tell you, you short drinkers, you just can't take it. That's Can true. you tell you the pints of the old beer? He's getting too old for it, he's Who, me? You, old time. I'm getting much too old. I wonder if I'll ever wear these things again. A morbid train of thought. Ah, uh, I don't have anything like that. I just don't like all this iron mongering. Everything so sharp. Yeah, I'll tell you these crammers would come in handy. In the summer. Went late in the old lawn. Look, you're following the tradition of great British explorers. I'm going outside and I may be some time. And all that. When we get down, I'm going inside and I may be some time. I'm going to give it plenty of that. Peter, careful you don't spike yourself with those things. You can easily get the front points caught in your gaiters and whoosh, over you go. So less of the Charlie Chaplin impression. Place your feet carefully. Fine, Ian. That's where we're going. Up there. Up this gully around to the left there. They're getting there, aren't they? Hard slog, isn't it? We sent Peter on ahead to practice a drill that every novice must learn. The slope we were climbing wasn't steep, and in summer if you slipped, you might go two or three feet. But in winter, under snow, a gentle bank of heather turns into a death slide. It's vital to know how to stop. How many marks do I get? You get none. You've left your axe up there. You're supposed to use that to stop yourself. Well, I thought I was going to throw it away. Use my hands. Typical beginner's trick. Is it to the axe away? Quite often in lives with it. Do it again. And this time, give it some thought. And a lot more style. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you'll get that. You'll be all right in the ridge? I think so. But it's just as well we've got him practicing on one of the easy slopes. Oh. And next year the crest to run! Without a sledge!
That's more like it! <laughs> The mist rolled in as we roped up at the foot of the gully that led 600 feet up to the summit ridge. A slight rise in temperature was causing lumps of snow and ice to break away. Peter didn't say anything but I knew what he was thinking. Whatever else happened, I didn't think we'd be avalanched. But as I led up the final pitch, Spindrift began to cascade down at an alarming rate. High above me, an overhanging cornice was blocking the direct route to the top. Was they so about leaving? Climb as if the boat weren't there. Don't fall up. I was forced to move left, where the climbing was more delicate, not hard, but hard enough to raise the pulse of the novice below. drove my axe into the snow and tied onto it. As belays go, this was hardly bombproof, but it would do. Okay, climb when you're ready. Peter was apprehensive. I could feel his tension transmitted through the rope, which was acting like a telegraph wire. His legs were shaking, and he began to strip precious snow from the footholds. Hey, Peter, you're not... 
crashing ice in a cocktail party, and it's done for me. Charles! Wreck it! Getting frostbite waiting for you. If you go and sit over by the axe there, and I'll bring Charles up, okay? Charles came up without incident as the sun broke through and lit up the summit ridge. At that moment, there was no other mountain to be on. We were giving this ancient place one day of our lives in exchange for memories that would last for far longer. Charles was tired, more tired than he cared to admit. So I didn't mention the other peak. It doesn't matter where you are, there's always another peak that a climber has to go up. And Charles had spotted it. He knew that I wanted to climb it. What's he looking at? He's wondering whether to bag that small peak over there. Well, if you're going to do it in, you better get a move on. You're a mind reader. We'd better stick together, though. How long will it take? About an hour. Maybe a little less. All right, we'll wait here for you. If we get a bit cold, then move off slowly. It's all downhill. OK. But if you come to anywhere you need a rope, just stop and wait. You're talking about my grandmother. <laughs> I mean it, Charles. Don't worry about us. We're going to catch you when you fall off, eh? <laughs> God, piss off. 
Right. I'll catch you up in about an hour, OK? Cheers. Cheers. Take care. Will do. See you. I didn't feel guilty about leaving them. If the weather did close in, I knew that Charles had the experience to get them both safely back down, and it looked as if an hour's rest wouldn't do them any harm. In bad weather, a man alone on a mountain can feel vulnerable and frightened. But on that day, as I climbed to the summit of Skur Kregenegg, I experienced that special feeling, that mixture of total peace and wild elation that cannot be found anywhere else. My two companions were on the next peak, but that was a thousand miles away. Cold, Charles. Well, I'm not too warm. How about you? Same. Sweat's starting to freeze. All right, come on, let's go down then. Safe enough. You might as well put a rope on. Whatever you think. Probably gonna have to buy him drinks all night for disobeying orders. I'm bloody freezing. Yes, yeah, well. Draft monkeys takes precedence over team discipline. At least at this stage. Never think about falling off. <laughs> no, I think fairly constantly about staying on. <coughs> Incredible, yeah. No. All right. Down. Someone's been down there before. Follow it down. That's right. You run into rock on the left. I say cross the rope. That's it turning on, that's the way. That's all right. It was on my way down from the summit that I saw them. They were roped together against my instructions and they were on the wrong route. I was annoyed and wanted to shout, but they were too far away. I sensed something awful was about to happen, and all I could do was to stand and watch.
They were hanging from a rope, about 300 feet down the gully. Below them was a drop of a further 500. The nearest help was five miles away. I could go for that, or try and do something myself. I said a prayer for all three of us, as I stepped, unroped, over the lip of the gully. I told you to wait, you idiot. Peter. Peter had a bad head wound and his breathing was shallow and uneven. He was close to death. That put the question beyond doubt. I would have to try and move them to safer ground. The rope that had saved their lives was now their enemy. In not too many minutes, the steady pressure of the loop around their waists would strangle them as surely as any garrote. The snow was getting softer, breaking away with unnerving ease. I put it out of my mind and stepped up to examine the rope. Their headlong descent had been stopped by a spur of sandstone, no more than three inches long. Somehow I had to secure it. If one of them came round and shifted position, they would dislodge it, with disastrous consequences. There was no room for a belay. The thin cord lashing was hardly satisfactory, but might make that crucial difference. I took out my spare rope and traversed out across the gully. There are no written instructions on how one man should lower two people down a mountain, but a plan was forming. I had to maneuver them onto the right line of descent. To lower them on their present course would send them into the rocks that were lying just below them. A belay point was needed and that meant sacrificing my axe. The very thing I'd warned Peter against just two hours ago. Thank God I had the spare rope. Without it, I couldn't hope to lower them the three or four hundred feet down the gully to safety. My best chance of survival was now firmly hammered into the snow. I looped the rope over and descended. Charles would have to be lowered first, after transferring him to my rope. Uh, 
I tied him on and took out my knife, hesitating. I wanted desperately to put off the next stage of the maneuver. 500 feet above the valley floor was no place to make a mistake. Dangling from the rock spur, the two bodies counterweighted each other. To cut Charles loose would send Peter crashing down the gully. Unless I could hold their combined weights with one hand for the two vital seconds it would take to cut the rope and tie a stopper hitch. Was I cutting the right rope? And how far would he slip before I could take up the string? Like heaving a drunk out of a bar, I dragged my friend across the gully to position him for the lower. I knew that broken bone was grating on broken bone, but thank God he was unconscious. I lowered Charles the full rope length and secured him. I would have to repeat this process until he was on safe ground and then do the same for Peter. All our lives depended on my will to survive and in the event of a slip, a small peg hammer. Both were about to be tested. The belay point for the second lower posed a big problem. The snow was too soft for the axe, and I didn't have a rock peg. 
I'd lost that. I would have to commit our combined weight to a rusty ice screw battered into a crevice. I tied Charles onto the ice screw, hoping that he'd still be there when I returned with the rope and axe. Climbing up and down the gully unroped was terrifying, and to cope with it, my body was demanding massive shots of adrenaline. This was beginning to run out. On top of everything else, I had a drug problem. As I tied Charles onto the rope for the second lower, I realized that what they say is true. People in extreme danger do pray very hard. The only thing that would keep that ice screw in the rock was a supreme act of faith. That shaky piece of metal had taken Charles another 160 feet down the mountain. I followed him on legs that were beginning to shudder with fatigue. It was around three o'clock. The sun was leaving and the temperature falling. The gully had suddenly become very cold. It was now imperative to get them both into shelter, however Spartan, and take a rest myself. It was pure luck that Charles had landed next to a small ledge. It wasn't ideal, but it would offer some protection against the wind, which was lashing our faces with spin drift hard powder snow that scoured the skin like a wire brush. Charles was still alive, but would have to add frostbite to his other injuries. I decided to put him into my spare anorak, saving my two extra pullovers for Peter.
My spare clothing and energy-giving food had gone. I had enough reserves for one last effort that would bring Peter down to the safety of the ledge. This time, I could join the two ropes together, which would make it easier. But easier than that was simply to stop and go to sleep. The raven appeared at the right time. In my childhood in the north, I had seen these birds peck the eyes out of a newborn lamb, and the hideous picture had stayed with me. I must not go to sleep. feet to the safety of the ledge, and the man whose life I was trying to save became my literal downfall. I tripped over him. The hammer flew out of my hand. I couldn't stop. I saw the boulder coming from 400 feet. of my right arm had all but gone. I could barely turn my head. In two hours it would be dark. If I couldn't reach help in two hours, I would probably die. My friends certainly would. my path. I crawled to the edge and looked across to the far bank. I knew I wouldn't make it to the top. My legs would no longer support me. 
The pain in my neck and arm was unbearable, but there was no way round. The only way was down. Since eight o'clock that morning, I'd climbed and traversed over seven miles. Surely I could manage another 40 feet. Unable to move, not wanting to move, it seemed that my fate was to freeze to death in that burn, imprisoned by a grass bank that a toddler could have climbed. I'd thrust them into my pocket that morning and forgotten about them. They would give me instant energy, not much, but enough. A soggy mush of blood, snow and sugar was going to get me up that bank. As I climbed, I thought about my two friends and the one man who could save me, Tom Patey. Tom was the doctor in Alapool and a first-class winter climber. I knew he wouldn't hesitate to put his own life at risk and search for them in the dark, but he would need a rough location, and I still wasn't out of the burn. Seeing that craft, I confess that my first thought was for myself. I was alive. The mountain had lost. But if the craft had a telephone, there was still time to win back two more lives. Be quiet, Lua. Now be quiet. Just keep quiet. I'm sorry to bother you, but I've got to get to a telephone. No telephone here. Debbie? Run down the road and stop a car. Bring her back here to fetch this gentleman and take him down to Mrs. Ross. She's got a telephone. Now hurry now.
the driver pulled away. He was evidently not familiar with Luke chapter 10, verses 25 to 37. The bit about the Good Samaritan. You won't take you. Did you tell him there's an injured man here? Yes. Well, why would I not wait? He said he didn't want any blood on the car seats. Uh, do you have to talk to Dr. Pitty yourself? I've got to. I, I... Get on to your bicycle and ride to Mrs. Ross. Tell her to come here as quickly as she can. She's got a car. Go on. Dundonald rescue team half an hour behind, gladly risked his own life in an effort to rescue two people he didn't even know. After covering five hazardous miles in total blackness in under an hour, he found them. <laughs> 